know your name, I know you great Yeah, 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 yeah. Control my life, so I put my trust in you. You control my life, I put my trust in you. I know your name, I know your grain. Bad vibes can't even come my way. I'm just tryna serve, Lord, bring that place. Back in the days, couldn't find my way, but I know you got me. I ain't no love like you and me. So I was blind, but now I see. Why got all this face on me? Good morning, church. Oh, it's loud. Good morning, how are we? Good, good. Have you had a good week? Have you had an okay week? A uh, bad week? No, good. Okay, most of you are. Oh, okay, cool. Well, okay, good. Most of us have had good weeks. That's, that's, that's good. Uh, I was listen, I've been listening to a song on repeat. It's called um, His Glory and My Good. Uh, it's by a, a worship band called City of Light. And um, I wanted to share the... Um, the chorus goes like this, so to our God be the glory, to our God be the praise, he alone, the name above all names. I will boast ever only in the Lord my God, for I know that his glory is my good. So uh, yeah, I just wanted to encourage you, if you've not had a good week or if you've had a great week, that good is subjective and his glory is our good. So look for, look for the areas in your life that you can glorify God, because that is the best thing for you. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to encourage you. We're about to start our service, so uh, welcome if you're here for the first time or if you're here for the hundredth time, welcome. Um, I'm going to lead us in prayer before the worship team start. Um, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for uh, today. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to come and serve you here, to worship you. Lord, thank you for the teaching and the word that we're going to, uh, that's going to be ministered to us. Father, I pray for the service to go uh, smoothly and well and that we're, we're able to leave here looking more like you, Lord. I pray that we're edified, that we're built up, that we're encouraged, that we're um, spiritually fed. And I pray that we, we have a wonderful time today, praising you, giving you the glory, the honor, and praise. And we thank you for all that you've done for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. If we could all rise up, if you are able, we will worship and praise God together. Amen. Amen, church. Amen. Amen. Turn into eyes. Open the eyes of the light. There's no one like you. None like you. Into, into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no If 
one beautiful beyond description to marvelous for to Thank you so much, worship team. That was so special. Thank you for leading us. Um, yeah, that was amazing. Guys, it is that time of the service where we go and meet uh, someone new. Feel free to move around the pews and say hi, and we'll be back in a few minutes. Okay, awesome. It is, uh, it's notices time. So, I'm going to run through some of these. We have a few to get through. Uh, and most of them should be up on the screen behind me as well. So, today, what's this? It's, like a, it's like being a teacher and waiting, looking at all the naughty kids. 
I start writing names on the wall. <laughs> cool. All right, so the first, uh, the first notice is uh, we have a members meeting today. So this is for uh, West Croydon Baptist Church members, and it will take place straight after the service in the sanctuary. So that's here. Um, we have limited copies of the we have limited copies of the agenda and the minutes from the last meeting at the back uh, on the back uh, my right your left uh, table, um, and you can also access those documents on uh, the church box portal, and they're in the WhatsApp community group chat. Um, which moves me nicely to the WhatsApp community. If you haven't already joined the group, there is a QR code on uh, the screen that you can scan on your smartphones um, and you, you're able to join the WhatsApp community. This is where we have important announcements so you can't just all message and stuff. So if you're worried about group chats popping off or too many notifications, you won't get that. Um, but it's a really good way to keep in touch of any important announcements that the church is making. Uh, if you're having trouble with uh, connecting or joining the WhatsApp uh, community, please speak to Rebecca or Swaley. Uh, Rebecca Swaley can give us a wave. Swaley's here. Rebecca's not here. But Re Swaley's here, so you can... Good Swaley, basically. Uh, and she'll be happy to help you. Um, or, or, or ask any of us who are, who are in the... Uh, who are already in, and we'll be able to help. Cool. Uh, next, next notice is baptism classes. So... Yeah, we'll, I think we can give a, a, a round of applause for that. Baptism classes. So it's an important thing to celebrate and to acknowledge. It's such a big part in our journey as Christians and as Baptist church members. Uh, if you are interested in being baptized or you're not sure of what that means and you want to ask some questions, we have a, a, a baptism a course that is run by uh, Brother Dapo and Sister Mope, and they'll be really happy to take you through the meaning of baptism, why it's important, uh, where, where, where our foundations are biblically, uh, why we do it, and then you can also ask any, any further questions. Um, Dapo is currently away for two weeks, but he'll be back, so keep your questions for then, and I'm sure we'll remind you again in two weeks. Uh, safeguarding, so we don't have a slide for this, but uh, the, the full safeguarding team has already been appointed, uh, so their pictures and the designated roles can be found at the back of the church. Um, and a summary of our safeguarding policy for the church will be presented at the members meeting this afternoon. So if you have any questions around that, you'll, you'll be able to uh, find out who to speak to on the back wall. But you'll also be able to find out a bit more information today uh, at the members meeting. Um, and that will also be included on the church box portal. Uh, quick question or request. If there are any current first aiders amongst you who are church members, could you please make yourselves known to Sheila Rose? Uh, so if you, you don't have to put your hand up now, but if you are a first aider uh, and uh, you are a church member, uh, please see Sister Sheila uh, at some point. Cool. Uh, Kids Zone is resuming today. That's great. Uh, please go with your leaders to your youth groups. I, I believe that's now actually. So Kids Zone, that looks like it's now. Uh, so if you're part of Kids Zone, if you want to follow your leaders uh, to your groups and have a lovely Sunday, uh, you, can, you can do that now. And youth, uh, we have an update on youth. So we actually have an exciting new curriculum uh, on core theologies. And that was introduced last week uh, with Rebecca and the team. Uh, so all youth from the ages of 11 to 18 are encouraged to attend. So if you're 11 to 18, um, you can continue your youth today. So you can follow your youth leaders also to the upper room. So youth are also going out at this point as well, if there's any youth going out. Rebecca's not here, so there's no youth today. Um, apologies, ignore, ignore that whole thing. But we do have a, a cool new core theology curriculum. So 11 to 18 for next week, if you're around, please do go with uh, Rebecca and the team. Awesome. Cool. Okay, so it's the uh, time of the service where we uh, where we pray, um, and then I've had a few announcements to make as well. So I know Sister Blessing um, here in the third row. She's um, unfortunately lost her her elder sister, uh, and you'll be travelling to Nigeria to 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 pay your respects. And uh, we just want to pray for you, Sister, um, through this hard time. And uh, I'm just going to lead us now, if that's okay. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for 
um, just for life, Lord. Thank you for the blessing of life. Thank you for all that we experience. And Lord Jesus, we know that you've walked in, in, our, in our shoes. You know, you know what it's like to, to, to walk and to talk and to eat and to laugh and to fellowship with us. Um, and Lord, you've, you, you had your friends, you had your siblings, and you also lost, Lord, as we, we learned last week in um, John 11, that you, you also know what it's like to, to weep and to feel that pain of, of loss. And Father, we pray for Sister Blessing and her family as they go through this difficult time of, of grief and of sorrow, Lord. I pray for the mourning period. I pray that, that they would all be able to uh, pay their respects to their sister and, and also be able to heal from, from this pain, Lord. I pray for your glory to be shown in this, in this situation, Lord, no matter how hard it might be. I pray that you would comfort and counsel in a way that only you can do. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would go with Sister Blessing and be with her family as they go through this hard time. Uh, Lord, I also want to lift up Sister Joyce in prayer as well, as she's uh, been suffering with COVID for, for a while now. Uh, Lord, we pray for full healing and full recovery for, uh, for her. Lord, I pray that you would be able to bring her back in full strength and health to our congregation, that she would continue to serve and be a light uh, amongst us. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, can I ask us all to stand for the Bible reading as I invite uh, Denzel up to lead us? And we'll also have the scripture on... Oh, there he is. I'll just pray for us quickly. Heavenly Father, thank you for your servant Denzel. Thank you for the faithful man of God that he is, Lord. Thank you that he is uh, eager to serve you, eager to learn, and eager to teach, Father. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak through him today in all the prep that he has done, Lord. I pray that you would uh, minister to us. I pray that you'd use him as your vessel. Uh, I pray that we would learn, be edified, and ultimately leave this place knowing more about you and looking more like you, Lord Jesus. And we pray that you, he, would, um, he would continue to serve us faithfully and that today, that as, he's, as he preaches, Lord, uh, that we, we would hear your voice and, and your words through, through his preparation and sermon. In Jesus' name I ask and pray. Amen. Amen. If you're there, say amen. amen. So when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and he's calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha uh, met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Amen. Please be seated. Church, I'm going to need your prayers this morning. For some weird reason, I woke up this morning not feeling too great. Um, I'm thinking all, all of the days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, on a Sunday when I'm about to preach, I'm just not feeling too, too great. Uh, so hopefully I get through this and God's word is preached. Amen? Amen. So we're still in John 11. Four weeks in John 11 and we're still not finished. We've got two more sermons in John 11. And here we find the shortest verse in the whole Bible, which is awesome. Praise God. So as we go through this, um, I pray that God will really speak to us. But let me pray and pray for myself particularly because I, I need the Lord's strength at this time. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for another day you've given us. We know, Lord, you are the great healer. And I pray, Lord, that you would um, heal me now, Lord. Uh, to, to preach your word faithfully, Lord. 
I pray for your children who are in this room today, Lord. People who you love so dearly. I pray, Lord, you will speak so clearly to them through your word. Use me in any way that you wish. But I pray I'll only speak the words from your holy scriptures. Give us ears to listen. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So church, I didn't realize that it was possible for Google to get some things wrong. Because this week I typed in on Google, how many gods are there? And Google told me that there were thousands of gods. In fact, there were some sources where I was told that there were millions of gods. Millions of gods that people worship. Millions of gods that people believe is all-knowing, all-powerful, and the creator of all things. Millions of gods that people give their all to. Millions of gods that people pray to. Some of the names that Google came up with with some of these gods are Zeus, Allah, Apollo, Krishna, Buddha, and the list goes on and on and on. Now, church, I might be biased in this room, but when I was looking at all of these gods, I didn't look at all the millions of gods, but when I looked at some of these gods, I could see that there was only one god who was really interested in having a relationship with the people he created. And there was only one God that, that sought the attention of the people he created. I realized when I was looking at all of these gods that there's only one God that loved his creation so much that he was willing to send his son to die for them. There was only one God who actually feels the pain of his loved ones. In fact, there is one God who I could see that is even willing to weep with his loved ones. Do we know the name of this God? He's the I Am, Yahweh, the God of the Bible. Amen? When you study the Greek gods, one thing that you see that is lacking in them is emotions. Emotions. For them, emotions is a sign of weakness. To see their God cry is weak. To see their God love is weak. But for Christians, the fact that we have a God that has emotions shows us that he's a God that deeply cares for his children. Amen. Can you imagine a mother with no emotions? A father with no emotions? I thank God that he's not a heartless God that just sits in the sky just judging people. But he actually has emotions. Church, do you know that God is not afraid to show his emotions? He's not afraid to show you how much he loves you. He's not afraid to show joy. He's not afraid to show anger. And I must say, this is an attribute of God that I love so much. I know we love the power of God and the hand of God and the healing of God, but what's so precious that we find in Scripture is the fact that we have a God who has emotions. And he doesn't just have one emotion. He's not just a God who is angry, like many people think he is. He's not just a God of love, where we can do no wrong. He just loves us, loves us, loves us. He's not just a God of joy, but he has all of these emotions. And all of his emotions are just, and they're right. When he's angry, he's just. When he's loving, he's just. When he's joyful, he's just. We, unfortunately, can't say the same thing because sin has tampered with our emotions. So sometimes we love the things that God hates, and we enjoy sin. And sometimes we don't always show righteous anger. Our anger can be sinful, but God has perfect emotions, and he's not afraid to show it like some men are. Speaking to my brothers in this room, some men find it really hard to show emotions. For them, it's a sign of weakness. And that's why you have some fathers who never show any emotions to their children. Or you have some men that you will never see cry, even though they're hurting. Of course, my ladies in this room, you don't have a problem with emotions. In fact, sometimes you guys need to chill out a bit. I'm not going to say too much because my wife is here. 
But we shouldn't be afraid to show our emotions. Jesus does. God does. In fact, we should ask ourselves the question, God, how does my emotions, how can they actually bring you glory? Because if every single thing about us is meant to bring God glory, then even our emotions should bring God glory. And of course, there needs to be a balance. Because some people are just too emotional with no biblical substance. And we see this with many different churches where they really want to heighten the emotions of people, but yet their theology and their understanding of God is very weak. You need to be careful of that. But also, you need to be careful that you don't go the other way, where you're too theological, you're too Bible, that you lack any emotion. That's why you go to some churches and they can't say amen, they can't smile, they can't clap. God wants you to worship him with his emotions, with your emotions. He wants your body, he wants your soul, he wants your emotions. I want to tell you, church, that God doesn't disregard your emotions. When you're angry, he sees. When you're crying again and again and again, he doesn't roll his eyes at you like maybe I would. But actually, he's a God that sees each tear that falls. And he sees your pain. And, and what I love about God is that he doesn't just see our pain, he actually feels our pain. And this is what we're about to see in this passage. Jesus cries at the funeral of Lazarus. Let me remind you, this is the savior of the world. He cried at the funeral of Lazarus. Now some people might say to me, Denzel, isn't he the same Jesus that you preached about last week, who said that he is the resurrection and the life, and anyone who believes in him, even though they die, they will still live? Then why is he crying? Doesn't he know the end of this passage? Then why is he crying? Well, let's open up our Bibles, and let's see what's going on in our passage. Amen? So if you were here last week, we saw that Jesus finally comes to the rescue. Mary and Martha, they called for Jesus to come and help their sick brother. Jesus, for some weird reason, decides to delay his coming deliberately. He, he waits for Lazarus to die in order for his glory to be seen. And last week, Mary, sorry, Martha and Jesus had an incredible conversation, remember? Where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. In this chapter, in this section we're looking at today, Jesus has a conversation with Mary, the other sister of Lazarus. And it's very interesting because in this conversation, Jesus doesn't speak much. In fact, he shows more emotions than he does give words. So let's look at verse 28 to 29. When she had said this, she went to call her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here, and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she arose quickly and went to him. Amen. When she had said this, do we remember what Martha said? I think we need to go back a bit because we realized last week that she probably gave one of the greatest statements of faith in the scriptures. She said, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of of God who is coming into the world. Amen. So this statement that Martha makes sets her apart as a Christian. And if you believe this statement, this statement sets you apart as a Christian. If you don't believe this about God, then you're simply not a Christian. It doesn't matter if you believe that God is nice and he's helpful and he's wise and he's good. Those things can't save you alone. But when you look at Romans 10 verse 9, it says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. This is what saves a person when we come to this knowledge of who Jesus is. You'd be surprised how many people think that they're saved because they said a simple prayer or because they own a Bible or because they come to church. That doesn't save you. You are saved once you believe that Christ is the Son of God who is coming into the world. Amen? So this is what Martha says about Jesus. So after this, after she made that, made that statement, she goes to get her sister, telling her in private that the teacher wants her. 
But church, do we ever see or hear Jesus telling Martha to go and get her sister Mary? We don't actually see that in the text. We don't see Jesus telling Martha to go and get her sister Mary. And I wonder why Martha goes to get her sister privately. It's possible that maybe Jesus did command that, but it's just not noted in this passage. Or it could be that Martha knew how much Mary needed to see Jesus, and so she goes to get her privately. These two things are possible. But what I love in this verse is the word private. It's possible that Jesus wants this one-to-one time with Mary. And it's possible that Martha wants this one-to-one time that she had with Jesus. She wants her sister to have this time too. Don't forget, Mary was at a funeral. Her loved one has died. And in those days, many people would come to the funeral. I don't know if you've ever been to a large funeral before. You will see how hard it is for the grieving family to be by themselves. Sometimes they can't even go to the toilet by themselves. People are there comforting them. And it's good. It's good that she had people there comforting her. But right now, Mary needs time with Jesus alone. Because what Jesus can offer Mary, none of these people can. And what Jesus has to say to Mary, none of these people can ever say. Human comfort is good. It's good. But nothing beats that one-to-one time with Jesus. Nothing beats the comfort that Jesus gives us in times of of pain. I am a big, big advocate of church. I believe in the church. I believe that every Christian should be involved in the church. I love the church. I love being here with you. I even pray that sometimes we can spend hours and hours and hours together worshiping God together. But I also recognize that nothing beats that one-to-one time with Jesus. And I realize that a lot of people find this hard. Some people love the church. They're good at coming to church. They feel strong at church. They feel better around other brothers and sisters in Christ. But when it comes to that one-to-one relationship with Jesus, they crumble. There are some people who can't do without church, but can do without a one-to-one time with Jesus. And we need balance. We see Jesus calls groups of people to himself. He calls the church to himself. And that's why we should never neglect the church. But he also calls us, calls us individually, as people. And that's why we weren't all saved at the same time. There was one time where God said, I'm saving you. I'm saving you. I'm saving you. That's why you're not just a number to God. He knows you by name. He knows you as an individual, not just as a group. He knows things about you that you've hidden from people. He knows the deep secrets that you keep. He sees the pain that you never share with anyone. You are not just a number to God. You are his child. Amen? So maybe you're in this room today and you're feeling the same way Mary is feeling in this passage. You're feeling pain, hardship. Maybe you've lost a job and financially it's hard or you've lost the loved ones, or or things are difficult, you have health challenges. I want you to see from this passage that Jesus seeks to meet you personally. Don't think that he's too busy helping that person who really needs help. No, he sees you personally, and he wants to help your particular need personally. Amen? So sometimes he might call us to leave the crowds, And just spend some one-to-one time with him. Knowing that he's the only one that can heal our broken spirit. So Martha is a good sister. She knew that she, her sister, needed time alone with Jesus. And so she goes and she gets her privately. Amen? We have to have this one-to-one time with Jesus. And I hope that as Christians today... We can encourage one another to have this one-to-one time with Jesus. When some people come and share some problems that they have, sometimes my simple response is, you need to spend some time with Jesus. 
But we can only share that if we ourselves are spending time with Jesus. So church, I want to encourage you, it's a message that I preach all the time, to carve out time personally with Jesus. I know you're busy. I know you've got work. I know you need to come to church and serve. I know that you don't have a lot of time. But I want to urge you to prioritize everything you can to spend time with Jesus. Amen. Let's read on. So, Mary, so Martha goes to get her sister Mary, tells her that the teacher wants you. And church, do, do you see her response to Jesus? My Bible says that she went quickly. Turn to your neighbor and say quickly. Turn to your other neighbor and say quickly. She went quickly. This is the kind of response that Jesus wants when he's calling us to come quickly. What a beautiful response that Mary has. Because I know that for me, if I, had a, if I had a brother that was sick and I asked Jesus to come and heal my brother and Jesus deliberately delays and then he comes to my brother's funeral and then he's asking to have some time with me, I am not going. You wasted my time, so I'm going to waste your time. But Mary goes quickly. My prayer for myself and for our church is that whenever the Lord calls, we will respond quickly. I pray that we will not be slow to answer in his call. I know that we hear sermons after sermons and have Bible studies after Bible studies, but sometimes we can be very slow to obey his very word that we are studying and hearing. And I pray that many people here will not be slow to answer the gospel call. Maybe you've heard gospel sermons after gospel sermons, but you still are very slow to come in close to Jesus. I pray that as you hear him, you will respond quickly. And the way that we respond quickly is to obey his word. So when he says, I want you to forgive one another, we must respond quickly. When he says, love one another, we must respond quickly. When he says, I want you to go into the world and baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we must respond quickly. Even when Jesus says, I want you to deny yourself pick up your cross and follow me, we must respond quickly. That was a very slow response. <laughs> but we must respond. I know that the Christian walk is not a sprint. It's not a sprint. But it must be a quick pace that we have when it comes to responding to God's word. She went quickly. Let's read on. Verse 30. To 32. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, <clears throat> If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Amen. So it's possible that maybe Mar Martha wants her sister Mary to have this private time. But I somehow think that maybe it was Jesus. Maybe he is the initiator here. Maybe he's the one that actually wants this private time with Mary. Because we see in this passage that he stays where he was. Jesus doesn't come close to the crowd just yet. It's almost like he's waiting for Mary to come to him. He's called and he's waiting for Mary to come to him. And this is the beauty and the patience that we see of our Lord, that he will not force you to come to him. There must be a willingness to come to Jesus. So maybe he is the instigator here. And what I love about this passage is where Mary runs to. My Bible says that she ran to the feet of Jesus. Mary knew that the best place to run to was the feet of Jesus. And this posture 
basically shows us that she had an attribute and a, a love for Jesus. But ultimately, it shows us, when she ran to the feet of Jesus, that she is surrendering to Jesus. She recognizes that, Lord, you are still the Savior, and I am still your servant, despite what has happened. She ran to the feet of Jesus. People who ran to the feet of Jesus were desperate. When you look at every single occurrences in the scripture where people ran to the feet of Jesus, they were desperate. They tried everything and nothing helped until they ran to the feet of Jesus. Remember the man who was de de demon possessed in the book of Mark? He ran to the feet of Jesus. Remember Jairus when his daughter died? He ran to the feet of Jesus. Remember the woman with the issue of blood? She ran to the feet of Jesus. The Sinephan woman who her daughter was possessed by demons, she ran to the feet of Jesus. The Samaritan leper ran to the feet of Jesus. Church, when you are going through troubles, who do you run to? Who do you run to? There are some things that are so difficult and you've tried everything. You've spoken to everyone. You've tried counselor after counselor, therapy after therapy, and nothing seems to help church. I think it's time that you run to the feet of Jesus and surrender your situation to him. Amen? The feet of Jesus was no stranger to Mary. In fact, she would run to the feet of Jesus in all situations, not just in bad ones. Remember when she wanted to learn, she sat at his feet. Remember today in, in our passage, when she was going through her darkest time, she ran to the feet of Jesus. And in John chapter 12, we're going to see that she worships at the feet of Jesus. Because the feet of Jesus is the best place to be. But I pray that we don't just run there when things are going wrong in our lives. But I pray that we will worship at his feet, we will get wisdom from his feet, and we will pray at his feet. Amen? This means that we surrender all our situations and humble ourselves to the King of Kings. Amen. Now it's clear that Mary and Martha are sisters because the same thing that Martha said last week is the same thing that Mary says. Lord, if you were here, my brother would not have died. They have the same thinking, same kind of faith. They believe that Jesus can do something or could do something while Lazarus was alive, but now that this monster called death has come, there is nothing that he can do. They had the same mind, the same theology, but Jesus is about to break it. Let's read on. Verse 33 to 35. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, Listen to this church. He was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And then we see Jesus wept. Amen. So this privacy thing that they wanted, either Jesus or Martha, it, it didn't really happen. Because when the people saw the way Mary got up quickly, they believed that she was going to the tomb of Lazarus to weep, so they went with her. And when they saw Mary weeping at the feet of Jesus, they also cried. But it wasn't just an ordinary cry, and it was wailing. They were wailing and wailing. And I don't know, and I really pray that no one's ever been in this position, but I don't know if you've ever been in a place where people are wailing. It's, it's horrible. It's, it's gripping. Even if you're in a room with just five people and they're wailing, it's gripping. Even if you don't know what's happened and you just walk into the room and people are wailing, it's gripping. It's horrible. And it moves your heart. And this is what we see happening in this passage. And John, the writer of this book, he's beginning to show us the humanity of Jesus. Jesus, who is fully God and yet fully man, he, he is deeply moved in his spirit 
and greatly troubled. Now, many scholars would admit that a lot of translations don't do the word deeply moved justice. Because the Greek word means to snort like a horse or to snort with anger. So it wasn't a, a situation where Jesus just felt a bit of pity. No, he actually made a, a sound of disgust. And because I'm not feeling too well today, I'm not even going to try to attempt to do that sound. But you can imagine it. Imagine the sound of disgust. And this sound came from his very spirit. His very spirit. I don't believe that Jesus was disgusted by their wailing. I think something deeper is going on here. And we're going to find out in a moment. But then we see that Jesus, hearing all of this wailing, he, he almost says, okay, I've had enough. Where have you laid him? Where have you laid him? And they say, come and see. And then we get the shortest verse in the Bible. If you're struggling to memorize Bible passages, start with this one. Jesus wept. Now, church, I want you to remember something. There were no chapters and verses in the original manuscripts. Chapters and verses came centuries afterwards to help Christians navigate the Bible better. So that means that whoever put these verses together saw this thing where Jesus wept and said, no, this needs to be left on its own. This needs its own verse. This is so important. The world needs to see that Jesus wept. And we have to be honest, if we're reading the book of John and in every single chapter we're seeing Jesus cry, then this passage won't have much significance. But we rarely see Jesus cry. And this weeping, this cry here was very different to the weeping and wailing that Martha and the people had when they came to Lazarus' funeral. It was a silent cry. But why? Why did Jesus cry? Church, why did he cry? When Jesus, he knows that in a couple of moments, he's going to stand at the tomb of Lazarus and say, Lazarus, come forth. And this man who has been dead for four days is going to walk out of that tomb and many people are going to believe in Jesus. Jesus knows that this is going to happen. But yet, he still cries. If I was Jesus, I'll be smirking. Knowing that something good is about to happen, I'll be smirking. But Jesus, he wept. And I believe he, he does this for two reasons. The first reason is simply because he was human. Fully God and fully man. And that's why Hebrews 4 makes it very clear that we, we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. And that's why we see Paul on his way to Damascus. Remember when he was about to persecute Christians? And Jesus meets him in a powerful way. And what does Jesus say to Saul? He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It shows us that Jesus feels the pain of his loved ones. That's why we can never say to God, God, you, you just don't understand what I'm going through. You can say that to other human beings. There are some people, yes, who just have no idea what you are going through. But you can never say that to God because he sees your pain, he sees your tears, and he even weeps with you. Even though he knows, according to Revelation chapter 21, that he will wipe away every tear from your eyes, but right now, when you're in pain, when you weep, he weeps too. Amen. And I really pray that we can catch on to this and have this same mindset, have this same heart as Christians, that when our brothers and sisters are going through times of pain, that we can cry with them, we can sympathize with them in order for us to be on our knees for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? But the second reason why Jesus wept 
was because he could see the effects that sin has on his loved ones. Church, I don't know if you've ever seen someone battling with cancer, someone who has terminal cancer, and you go to visit them, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible. And sometimes when I have to do partial visits for people who are battling with cancer, when I leave their presence, I shout and I say, I hate cancer. I hate it so much. Church, do you know that Jesus has even greater anger over sin? He could see what sin was doing to his loved ones. They were in pain, in agony because of the result of sin, the consequence of sin, which is death. They're wailing, they're weeping because of this monster, this beast called death. Jesus hates sin, so he wept. What we simply get from this passage is, is that Jesus is troubled over sin. He is disgusted about sin, and that is the very reason why he came to the earth that he created to defeat sin. In fact, he was willing to leave his throne to come and crush this monster called sin. Jesus wept because of sin. So my question for us today is how much do we hate sin? Do we weep over our sins and the sins of the world? Are we disgusted over our sin and the sins in our world? Are we deeply troubled by our sin and the sins of our world? We must weep over the things that Jesus weeps over and we must hate the things that he hates. But I wonder if maybe we've minimized sin and we laugh over sin and without even knowing it, we celebrate sin. We undermine sin. Jesus wept. And we also see, the, the ladies in this room will know when we looked at Genesis chapter 6 yesterday, that God even regretted making man because of sin. I want us to really sit for a moment and, and think about this. Jesus doesn't cry often in the scriptures, but he wept over sin. And I believe that Jesus, when he went to heaven, he didn't change forms again. He still is fully God and fully man. And I have a feeling that Jesus is at the right-hand side of the Father and he's still weeping as he looks at us and he looks in our world. I have a feeling that he's still weeping, maybe even greatly, because he's given us a way out of our sin. I pray that as individuals, we will never take sin lightly. And I pray that these words will ring through your mind. Jesus wept. Don't let anyone minimize sin in your life. And honor and get close to those who point out sin in your life. Because Jesus wept. Amen. Let's look at the last verses. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? What I love about Jesus is that he's not like me, that if I started crying, I would quickly wipe my tears away or I'll hide my face. I don't want people to see me in a vulnerable state. Sometimes for me, it does show a sign of weakness. It ruins my street cred. But Jesus, he wept openly. So people could see it. People could see that he wept. And they could see, because they see tears running through his eyes, they could see that Jesus deeply loved Lazarus. They could see his love. His, his love for Lazarus was clear to see. See how he loved him. And those words really stuck to me because isn't that the, the goal of the Christian faith? Isn't that the sign that we are true believers of Jesus Christ, that the world will see us 
and say, see how they love each other? Remember John chapter 13 where Jesus says that the world will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. One of my prayers for this church is that when new people come to our church, yes, they might say that, you know, West Croydon Baptist Church, the carpet doesn't look too good. It's a weird color. But did you see how much they loved each other? I hope that people can come to this church and say, look, West Croydon, they have a crack in their ceiling. Don't look up, church. They, they have a crack in their ceiling. People are still looking up. But did you see how much they loved each other? Jesus' love for Lazarus was evident to see. But you know, for these people, I think they missed the point. I wish that a few chapters later, that when they saw Jesus beaten, when he bled and hung up on the cross, I wish then they could have said, wow, see how much he loved us. Because the cross is the greatest display of God's love for us. If you're in this room and you, you don't feel like God loves you or you don't believe that he loves you, all I can say is look at the cross. I know that the, the, the heart is the universal symbol for love, but really and truly, it should be the cross because the cross of Jesus is the greatest display of his love. The cross actually speaks, it screams, and it tells you and I, you see how much I love you? The cross. The cross is the greatest display of God's love. These people could see that he had the power to open the eyes of the blind and he could have kept this man from dying. And Jesus is about to show them that he can do a lot more than just open the eyes of the blind. He can bring dead people back to life again. Amen. I'm going to stop there because of time. But church, I've said a lot this morning, but I just want to leave you with five points. The first point is, do you hear Jesus calling? Do you hear him calling? Do you hear him calling you to himself? Calling you to his word? Calling you to his love? Do you hear him calling? The second thing is, will you rise quickly to his call? Will you rise quickly to his call. The, first thing, the third thing that I want to remind you today is that Jesus wept. He sympathizes with our pain. He promises to be with us in our pain, but also promises that he will wipe away every tear from your eyes. But another thing that should make us weep is to know that he will not wipe away every tear of every person. But there will be some people who choose to reject Jesus who will be weeping forever. And knowing that should make us weep and should make us respond quickly to the core of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to remind you in this room and I want you to see that Jesus hates sin. And I pray that we too will hate sin. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Let's pause for a moment, church. And let's reflect on this passage. And maybe the verse just to think about and reflect over and to memorize is verse 35. Jesus wept. This isn't just a, a truth found 2,000 years ago, but it's a reality today. I know 
to my brothers and sisters in this room, I know that you cry. I know that you're in pain. I know that you go through challenges. I want you to, to know that the church is here to support you, but more importantly, I want you to see from this passage that Jesus is with you and he sympathizes with your pain. I also want you to see that he wept over sin. And every time you and I choose to disobey him, every time we choose to disobey his word, he's grieved. And that's why today, people filled with the Holy Spirit, we know that the way that we grieve the Holy Spirit is through our sin. And so I pray that you will be quick to repent. We might not see how dangerous sin is, how destructive sin is, but Jesus wept. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for helping me get through this sermon. Give me strength. But most importantly, Lord, let your word go forth, pierce through hearts, heal hearts, challenge, rebuke your people in this room. Help us as a church to weep over the things that you wept over. Sin. Help us to seek righteousness. Help us to seek holiness. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Church, we're going to continue to, to worship the Lord. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come. And they're going to lead us in a time of sang worship. Thank you. Hallelujah. If we could all rise up. Amen.
church thank you uh, take a seat guys um, do we have any visitors here for the first time you just raise your hand I see I see one he's not raising his hand yet I don't want to embarrass him but if you have any, if you're here for the first time we have something to give to you as a little gift um, so welcome um, yeah, back. Right. Um, cool I'm going to close us in prayer. Are there any other visitors? Sorry, I feel like, does he? Yes. Hello. Yes, hi. Um, so, yeah, cool. We have two more. Of the Yeah, let's give them a round of applause. Welcome to West Croydon. <laughs> Sorry, we don't want to ever embarrass you guys. We just want to give you something nice. But yeah, welcome. And we'll hope to see you guys again soon. Um, I'm going to close us in prayer. Uh, cool. If we just bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you so much um, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful message, the wonderful reminder that you are, a, you are a God who walked in our flesh, that you weep, that you feel compassion, that you love, that you laugh, that you, you know our pains, you know our struggles firsthand, Lord. Thank you that you, you died for us and that the, the ultimate symbol of love is the cross, Lord. Thank you so much that you sacrificed yourself that we could have a relationship with you, O oh God. Thank you for your love, your redemption, your salvation. Lord, I pray that as we go out into our weeks, uh, we've, our jobs, our schools, our, or, or whatever sort of um, responsibilities or tasks that we have on our list for the week, Father, I pray that you would remind us daily um, as, we, as we ingest your word, Lord, that ultimately that you are good, that you are God, and that we live to serve you, that we live for your glory. Thank you for everything that you've done for us, and I pray, Lord, that in the weeks to come, uh, sorry, in the week to come, that we, we remember that and we look to glorify you in everything that we do. I pray for favor. I pray for blessing for the things that we, uh, we want, but let us submit those plans to you, and we ask that you have your way in our lives this week. Um, and I pray for safe journeys uh, as we leave, as we leave um, West Croydon today. And I pray that you be with us. In Jesus' name, we ask and pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, if we could stand church for the benediction, we also have, it's been done. Um, if we could stand for the benediction, we'll read it together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. We've got refreshments in the back. And a quick, a quick thanks to the worship team, the AV team, and all the, all the ministries that serve. We just give them a round of applause for their faithfulness and stuff. And we hope to see you guys all soon again. Amen. I have made you too small in my Oh Lord, forgive.
Gracious to you. 